to the room. <laughs> um, anyway, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. I'm Olga Visa, the director of the museum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight and invite you to meet the artist, uh, Matthew Barney, who will be in conversation with Nancy Spector, curator from the Guggenheim Museum. And we're just getting the sort of mics together uh, and ready to get moving. Um, our Meet the Artist series, as many of you know, is an ongoing series here at the museum uh, where we really offer opportunities for contemporary artists to engage in dialogue often with other artists, with curators, and with you, the public. And as the National Museum here on the Capitol Mall, we're dedicated to enhancing public understanding of the art and artists of our time. And so this series is really under affirms our commitment to that goal here at the Hirshhorn. Um, I want to extend my thanks to the Stephen and Heather Mnuchin Foundation. Uh, they have made uh, and provided ongoing support for this series now for a number of years. And we're really grateful to them for helping to support not only this program, but many programs that we offer here at the museum that would not be possible without the support of private individuals and foundations um, like the Mnuchin Foundation. I also want to take this opportunity to invite you to all come back. Um, in a couple of weeks, we are going to be opening a new exhibition on February 15th, uh, drawn from the Hirshhorn's collection. It's called Refract, Reflect, Project, Lightworks from the Hirshhorn's Collection. And this is an exhibition that will be on view from February 15th until April 1st. And it's really an extraordinary look at some wonderful works in the collection that use light as a means to explore some very fundamental issues about vision and perception. So we'll put that on your calendar. And at, concurrently with that show, we'll also be featuring a new acquisition, uh, a work that just is coming to the museum as a gift to the collection. It's a piece called Payphone by Robert Lazzarini. And it was a work that was first seen at the Whitney Biennial in 2002, um, a very surprising and one of the more memorable, memorable inclusions in that exhibition, uh, a very optically arresting piece that I hope you'll appreciate as much as we do. And finally, I um, ask you to also mark your calendars for March 9th. We're going to be opening a new um, project in the lobby of the museum, a collaboration between Virgil Marty and Pei White, who have created a wonderful installation and interactive um, environment in the lobby space. And we're going to kick it off uh, with an after-hours program that evening. So we'll be open till midnight that night. And there'll be an opportunity to meet both Virgil and Pei and to partake of music and programs and many things throughout the course of the evening. So now I'd like to introduce our very, very special guests um, here tonight. And first, uh, Matthew Barney. We really had, we've had a wonderful relationship with Matthew over the years and um, have been able to present his unforgettable film works. Um, really from early on, and in fact, uh, for, for a number of years, we were the only venue here in Washington to present the Craymaster series, presenting the films as they were made. Uh, and for us, that was a great privilege to be able to present those and to work with Matthew and present the complete series. We also included Matthew's work uh, in an exhibition that we did in 2000, which was the 25th, 25th anniversary exhibition um, of the Hirshhorn that focused on aspects of beauty in contemporary art. And that was the first time, if I remember correctly, Matthew, where the Craymaster photographs had all been seen together for the first time, drawn from the various films. And Matthew had a key role um, and a key figure in that exhibition. So it's been really a pleasure uh, to know Matthew and to follow his work over the years uh, and to really follow his successes and to be able to present his work here in an ongoing way. Since the late 1980s, Matthew has distinguished himself with a very surprising and provocative body of work, emerging from performance, but also bringing together a number of media, from photography and film and sculpture and sculptural installation, which are all intricately woven together to create this fascinating symbology and very complex visual language that's arresting, that's unforgettable, um, and at times quite mystifying and confounding. Matthew was born in San Francisco in 1967. He spent part of his youth in Idaho and also New York. He's a graduate of Yale, graduated in 1989, and he was given his first solo exhibition at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art in 1991 at the age of 24. Since then, Matthew has shown extensively in exhibitions with solo and group shows around the world, as well as many international exhibitions, including Documenta in 1992, 
the Whitney Biennial exhibitions in 93 and 95, and also in the Aperto 93 section of the Venice Biennale for which he was awarded the Europa Prize, the Europa 2000 Prize. He's been awarded numerous other prestigious prizes, including the Guggenheim Museum's Hugo Boss Award in 1996. And New York Times critic Michael Kimmelman has dubbed Matthew one of the most important artists of his generation. And that is clearly attested to by so many young artists working in a variety of media and, and, and different disciplines who credit Matthew really for paving the way. And I think also traces of Matthew's language, his aesthetics, can also be traced in a lot of popular culture and in, in the media and in advertising. And perhaps the most memorable example to me was the Frito-Lay commercial of a couple of years back that featured a blimp <laughs> overlooking the football field. Um, in 2003, our colleague Nancy Spector from the Guggenheim Museum uh, organized Matthew's um, Craymaster Cycle exhibition, an exhibition that brought together all the various elements of the Craymaster series, both sculpture, the installations, and the film works. Uh, and most recently, Nancy collaborated with Matthew on a fascinating exhibition uh, that looks at the work of Matthew together with Joseph Boyce. And that's something they're going to touch on and, and talk about today. It, was a, it took place this fall at the Deutsche Guggenheim in Berlin. Indeed, Nancy has worked very closely with Matthew over many years, and we thought she'd really be the ideal partner um, to have and engage in a dialogue with Matthew tonight. And Nancy is the Curator of Contemporary Art and Director of Curatorial Affairs at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum in New York. And she's curated many, many wonderful exhibitions there, um, including those on conceptual photography, Felix Gonzalez Torres. At the Deutsche Guggenheim in Berlin, she initiated commissions with Hiroshi Sugimoto, Lawrence Wiener, Andreas Leminski. And she is now uh, currently working on, um, she was selected as a curator to curate the U.S. Pavilion at the 2007 Venice Biennale, which will present the work of Felix Gonzalez Torres, whose retrospective she also organized at the Guggenheim in 2005. So please join me in welcoming Matthew Barney and Nancy Spector. And what we're going to do for the format of the evening, they're going to engage in a dialogue together, and then we're going to open it up for questions. Um, and at 8 o'clock, Nancy needs to step away to catch a train, but we'll continue to take questions. So enjoy the evening. Welcome. Um, good evening. Hello. Uh, thank you so much, Olga, uh, for the wonderful introduction, but also the invitation to come here and continue a conversation that Matthew and I have been having now for quite some time, um, and it's still ongoing, so we're very happy to share it with you. Uh, as Olga mentioned, um, this past October, we opened an exhibition called All in the Present Must Be Transformed, uh, Joseph Boys and Matthew Barney, which looked at... Um, affinities and fundamental differences between the two artists. And I thought I'd speak just for a few minutes about the genesis of that project and then um, start asking Matthew some questions about that show, which will lead into probably um, sort of a more deeper analysis of, the, analysis of his own work. But the conversation about boys really began in 2003 when we were installing the Cremaster Cycle exhibition in the Guggenheim space. And you're seeing an image of it right here. Um, so if I can turn this, you can also see the screen. Um, our conversation often to turned to boys. Oh, that doesn't help, is it? No, it's okay. Okay. That um, Joseph Boys' retrospective ha took place at the Guggenheim in 1979, and it was really present in our minds, almost like a kind of ghostly presence in a sense, in that boys created a, um, an operatic, site-specific installation that wove together the biographical and mythological aspects of his own oeuvre. Um, and very much in the way that Matthew's Cremaster cycle wove together his own biography, um, references to popular culture, myth, in a very performative um, presentation. And I hadn't forgotten that, and then when an opportunity came up to do an exhibition in Berlin at the Deutsche Guggenheim, um, I asked Matthew if he'd be willing to explore the, the affinities and, and, and um, similarities and differences in an exhibition. And some of the, the um, similarities are quite obvious in a way in that there's a shared fascination with eccentric materials. For Math Matthew, it's Vaseline. For boys, it's fat and felt. They have metaphoric resonances in both 
both bodies of work, interest in transformation, metamorphosis, um, and also the relationship between action and the object, which I think is um, really germane to both bodies of work. And these are things that we tried to bring out in the exhibition. So I think I'll, I'll open the questions with asking you, um, now that the show is actually just closed and um, will be present again, we'll be showing it at the uh, Peggy Guggenheim Collection in Venice for any of you who are traveling to the Venice Biennale, so you can see it in altered form there. Um, if you learned anything differently from this process about, uh, about boys, about your, your own presuppositions, presuppositions about his work or about your own work, in the process, and I'm going to flip through some images while you speak uh, mm -hmm. from the Guggenheim and boys. Yeah, I think the uh, the thing that uh, surprised me the most was to see uh, the drawings paired together. I think most of our dialogue had to do with sculpture and and to do with um, you know different classifications of, 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 of sculpture, narrative sculpture, and um, sculpture that had to do with action. Um, performance, um, and somehow the drawings were taken for granted in a certain way. We, you know, we talked a lot about them too, but I think um, to see them hanging together was 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 probably the most interesting thing for me, uh, or the most surprising thing, sort of in the way that both both bodies of drawing felt uh, uh, removed from their. Um, the place that I felt that they occupied. They sort of met in a, in a very different place. I think there was a, with, with, with sculpture, there was a, a, you know, there was sort of more of a, of a, of a dialogue taking place. And, um, and also with the, the, the moving image, with the video and the, uh, um, the films that we showed. But the drawing, I felt, made... Um, um, my drawings feel like they belong to a different time. And, um, and his drawings, which I've always felt like, um, felt like they'd been unearthed from a kind of ancient place. They felt, uh, they feel, um, they feel uh, really much older than, than they are. I mean, in a very provocative way. And uh, yeah, they, they seem to meet in a place that, that uh, they met in a time that didn't belong to either of them. It's interesting that some of the press reactions to the exhibition dealt with this idea of the time between you, but it was mostly about that boys, it, it, it provided a, a different perspective on boys and in many cases made his work feel maybe more relevant or more contemporary um, than he had previously been experienced, at least in recent years, in, in Germany. Um, so I know that the, that was certainly a kind of public reaction to that. But I have a, a slide here because you mentioned the, the um, mm -hmm. connection of drawings. And that, I think, for me, was one of the real impetuses to do the exhibition. So I was going to ask maybe if both of you could move your mics. Oh, oh, yeah. I know this will sound hard. OK. Up. Where? If I do that, it'll be uh, inside my jacket. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Okay. Try. Okay. Um, sorry about that. That the just the literal formal connections between. Um, your two bodies of drawing in terms of a you know, kind of ten tentative line and a, a certain nervousness, um, a lightness to, to your draftsmanship. And then, of course, how central drawing is to both your work and Boise's from anything to, uh, from the fact that you use it as a conceptual sketches uh, and, and very finished drawings. This is a drawing we're showing from um, the most recent body of work, Drawing Restraint 9, which is happening after the film and the sculpture. Mm. Uh, but they, of course, exist in other ways. And here's some um, 
images of the very first body of work, Drawing Restraint, that you did as a, as a student at Yale, where the um, you know, drawing was used as part of a performance project, but that helped you tap into the um, ideas of hypertrophy and resistance. And maybe you could talk to starting there a little bit about mm. um, the way you use drawing in that performative way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, well, to go back to what you were talking about before the, these different classifications of drawing, I think that the way that drawing works for me now is, uh, is, is it's a starting point. When I start a project, it's, uh, it's um, the first ideas of, a, of what would become a larger work are, um, are worked out in drawing. They're, um, um, and they start to develop into what would become a storyboard for something um, that would be uh, shot on film or video. Um, and, uh, and once it, it, it becomes a storyboard, the, the, drawing, um, the drawing changes. It, it becomes, um, you know, it moves away from being a kind of a conceptual mapping of what the, um, the body of the project might uh, um, you know, how it might start taking shape to, to drawing literal frames uh, of images that would be captured by the camera. Um, so it becomes uh, more literal in the process of making the film. And then at the end, um, after, uh, after the film is finished, or after this text is, is finished, and um, these narrative sculptures are made from that text. Uh, drawings are then made from those narrative sculptures in a way. That the, so the, 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 the drawing the is sort of the, the last, um, sort of most distilled uh, part or point in the, in the project. So that drawing you had up a moment ago was an example of a, of a drawing like that that would come after um, everything else. And then, in terms of the body of work, drawing restraint, which mm. kind of as you're speaking about drawing being beginning at the end, I mean, this body of work really encapsulates everything you've done in mm. a way thus far, and that you've started this as drawing restraint two, and you've just done drawing restraint 11, mm -hmm. um, with I think there's more in the process now, but that it's been a cycle in your work that's been continuous. Mm -hmm. and obviously, there's more involved than just the act of drawing, but that you've used that as the, the um, impetus in a way mm -hmm. you know, to make a mark mm -hmm. and what it takes to make a mark. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case, to make a mark through or against resistance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when I started doing these in school, uh, I would do them in between um, uh, sculptural projects. After I'd finished making something, I would set up a, a situation like this in, in uh, the studio, um, a situation where I could um, generate a lot of drawing. And, um, and I think that there, was, there were a couple of things happening at, at that point for me. One was that I was um, I was uh, trying to um, to take my previous experience as, as an athlete and, um, and 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 use it as a way of uh, informing my my studio practice. Um, and um, as I was gravitating more toward uh, performance work, I think that the, the work I had done with my body as a, as an athlete felt like um, it felt useful. It felt like a way of uh, thinking about the development of form, aesthetic form, um, and that as an athlete you're so, um, or I was so aware of that uh, that process of developing, you know, toward what would eventually be performance on the, the football field, but the development of the body on the way to that, the training process, mm -hmm. um, was always much more meaningful to me than than the field of competition, and I think. Um, 
And I think that I eventually started feeling that way as an artist, that, that the process of, of, of making something was, was far more interesting than, than the finished work. And I think that's what Drawing Restraint ended up becoming, really, this idea of um, creating, a, creating a situation where uh, the, um, you know, the proposal to make a finished drawing would be overcome by some kind of hindrance against that, some kind of condition that would um, would encourage mark making, but would um, kind of derail the, the um, sort of um, the vanity of, of making a finished drawing. And that plays out on many levels throughout your work, that concept, like the, the cremaster cycle being the five-part mm. circular mm -hmm. You know, operatic whole that never can complete itself and rehearses mm -hmm. that incompleteness mm -hmm. in a sense. Yeah, and again, I think that the that the source of that is really that 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 feeling um, as a as an af athlete of of being um, of you know of training and preparing and and and, and storing uh, storing energy and storing. Um, what felt like potential energy in the body and, and feeling like the second you step onto the field, it would all disappear. And um, so there's, um, you know, I think a lot of these artworks that were made have to do with uh, trying to draw a line between that, that space where, where things are very fertile and, and potential energy is at its greatest and, um, and this, um, conflict of stepping over the line and, and, and watching all that energy disappear. I'm just, now there's just some images of some early drawings. Um, to give an example, again, these are finished drawings, not, to, would you say they were done after the, the fact? Some are, some aren't. I mean, this is an example, for instance, of what would have come uh, at the very beginning of a project, this was done um, when uh, three projects were being visualized. One um, took place in Los Angeles, one took place in uh, Germany, and one in in, uh, in New York. And they were um, it was visualized as a kind of trilogy. One was the condition of incline. In the center, there was auto shaft and. Um, on the other end was the facility of decline, and these were um, it was a story that was acted out by by uh, Jim Otto and, and Harry Houdini, and in the center this uh, auto shaft space was um, governed by Al Davis, who was um, Jim Otto's coach or his manager, and um, um, yeah, so these um, kind of conceptual mappings of the, of the Projects tend to feel more like that mm -hmm. kind of drawing. Mm -hmm. And relate to some of the sketches, actually, you know, jumping ahead to the Cremester Cycle storyboards, mm -hmm. like the aerial view of the, the chorus girls, which I think I have here later um, for Cremester One on mm -hmm. the field. And then this is to show, this is Drawing Restraint Seven, to show how um, generous, in a way, or flexible the concept of drawing restraint is and moves out of the studio. Um, and into something that's much more narrative with characters, um, a sense of cinematic, even though these are still on monitors, uh, but with characters, but still dealing with this notion you're talking about of the, the conflict or the tension of, um, of you know, potential energy, you know, dissipation. And here it's this battle over making a mark mm. um, and the hubris involved in thinking one can actually achieve it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, I think the other reason why this one feels a lot different is that there was quite a bit of time that, that mm -hmm. passed between number six, which was done in, what, 89 or something like that, and, and this, which was done in 93. And um, I think in that time, I had done that um, Otto Houdini project, and, um, and uh, was, um, particularly after Otto Shaft was starting to get very um, addicted to this idea of, 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 uh, of allowing the piece to be uh, blatantly narrative. 
And um, I mean, in a funny way, not to uh, to expand the the video language, but more in the way that it felt like it was starting to liberate the sculpture by um, identifying them as narrative sculpture, and um, you know, and allowing for that relationship between the the um, the the action, um, whether it be a performed real-time action or a kind of projected narrative and the object, um, I guess to become a little more um, blurred, mm -hmm. that relationship. And it, it, uh, it felt quite good to, um, yeah, to uh, embrace the, the, the narrative. And so, yeah, Drawing Restraint Seven, Seven is, of course, a much more narrative approach to the Drawing Restraint project. It sort of t it tells the story of um, of uh, Apollo and Marcius in some way um, in the back of this limousine, and uh, uh, yeah, it, um, it takes that that kind of threshold I was trying to describe earlier, um, and and aligns it with a sort of moral um, that moral threshold that, that exists in that myth between um, the uh, satyr and the god and uh, this proposal of, of challenging the god and the, the punishment the punishment that takes place yeah I've always seen this as a portal onto the cremaster cycle yeah that an auto shaft sort of mm -hmm. leading you leading you to that sort of really epic narrative um, but it was really interesting to see that you circle back around after um, I think this is an, an installation shot two of them of Drawing Restraint 7, but um, circling o around afterwards to Drawing Restraint 9, after the Cremaster Cycle, to kind of return to that same, uh, the equation mm -hmm. that you were exploring in the, in the earlier body of work. These are examples we were talking about before of storyboards for Cremaster um, Cycle films mm -hmm. with drawings that were conceptual sketches. Mm -hmm. There's two. These are from San Francisco. Um, did you want to say anything about your return to this um, kind of live action after the Cremaster cycle and having really stepped away from that, those kinds of exercises? Um, yeah, well, I would say uh, that um, I, mean, I think it's something that you're going to show some images of later, but the, um, I mean, the moment after the Cremaster cycle was, um, uh, I mean, that was more um, to do with this, this craving of, you know, wanting to go into a situation where um, I was really out of control, and uh, I ended up doing that with, with Dalai Lama, and we can talk about that later, but... Uh, I think these pieces, um, which are much more like the the more provisional drawing restraint pieces that I was doing in school, came just after drawing restraint nine was finished, and um, and um, yeah, it felt like uh, it felt quite good to be able to to start and finish a piece within one sitting and uh, um, rather than two years I, rather than two years, two years yeah yeah the um, which I still feel I still feel now um, in the sense that I'm not um, you know, I'm really not particularly interested in, in making another film anytime soon um, so that I'm, I feel like I'm trying a couple of things that I've, I've done in the past, um, things like this, uh, more provisional uh, performances and actions, and uh, starting to experiment with some um, um, you know, other forms of performance, um, with stage, uh, smaller stage works, maybe potentially larger stage works. But um, um, I think the impulse to do this again has to do with that, um, feeling like the, the uh, the experimentation with um, 
with the sort of cinematic, um, the cinematic project, the, the working at that scale and in that mm -hmm. medium, um, is at a point where I'm not really interested in um, in taking it any further, um, sort of in the trajectory that it's on. Right. I feel like it's it's come um, to the point where I'm, uh, yeah, I'm finished with it for now. Just for people in the audience that. Um, these images are from an exhibition, Drawing Restraint 9, that was in um, Kanazawa, Japan, and, and Korea, and then was at the San Francisco Museum of Art. And like the Cremaster Cycle exhibition at the Guggenheim, this really summed up all of the Drawing Restraint projects thus far, um, to which you appended these two, Drawing Restraint 10, Jumping on a Trampoline, and then um, to make these drawings. And then this was in. This was in Korea, wasn't it? No, no that, that's in Japan. Oh, also. So, oh yeah. it was both. Okay. Yeah. Um, climbing. To um, also make a drawing. And then sort of shifting to another thematic thread that runs through the um, exhibition in Berlin. Um, connecting your work is this the um, relationship between the action or live performance and the object and whether it's a, a relic from the, um, from the performance or in, in many cases for, in, for you a, a sculpture that um, is imbued with the narrative that takes place in the performance itself. And this is a view of uh, Boyes' Eurasian staff um, performance that exists on video which we showed in Berlin um, with the felt four of the tall of felt um, angles as um, an example of how Boyes' performances often engendered um, sculpture slash relics that somehow were to contain the, the essence of the ritual um, enacted in the performances. And we paired that in the show with Matthew's early field dressing. Um, this is a, a still from the video. Um, and this is a, not, a, not a view from Berlin, but one from PS1 recently. The installation with the, with the video monitor showing it. And I thought maybe you could start by talking about, for you, um, what appears to be a very conscious relationship between you know, performing never publicly um, and then allowing the, the footage of the performance to exist in proximity to a sculptural object that was used or and probably also then um, somehow um, altered or changed for exhibition. Mm -hmm. And how the conscious, and maybe, you know, we were talking a little bit before, this relates to your own interest in, um, in performance art from the 70s and, mm -hmm. and the idea of ritual and endurance, but you know, obviously wanting to, to do it differently or bringing it up to date in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think that the, the, the artists from Boyce generation, both in, in Europe and in the States, um, were, I mean, they were certainly uh, influential for me. And um, I think at a certain point, uh, I realized that uh, the things that I was looking at were, um, were, were, were fragments of what, what had happened. Um, I mean, I, th I think, what, especially with somebody like Boyce, it takes a while to understand that that's what it is that you're looking at, because he, um, I mean, he used photography in a very particular way, the way that, that sculptures are photographed in, in detail, rather than in, um, you know, in a broader, in a broader view. So you never really um, feel like you're seeing the whole thing, and. Um, and of course, with a lot of the work in the in the 60s and 70s, um, you know, there wasn't an extensive documentation of this stuff. Um, and if there was, I didn't really have access to it. So, um, you know, you're looking at a single still of of a four-hour-long performance and feeling like you have some kind of an understanding of this thing, which is pretty interesting. Um, and um, and, and actually, interesting enough for me that I think it started to in, inform or influence the way I was thinking about about these videos, about uh, performing something, 
uh, for the camera and um, and and using um, and using video in a way that it would sit somewhere between uh, an honest document of something that had actually happened in real time and um, something that exists more like a proposal for something that may have, may or may not have happened and um, and I think in doing that it it um, it started to um, suggest that uh, um, you know, that there could be a, a relationship between a moving image and an object in the same space that wasn't um, uh, overdetermined um, in the way that that it often can be. I think, in my opinion, that you know, when you walk into a space and there's video running, um, it's um, it's difficult for it to not be didactic or um, to um, absorb all of the the energy in the room. Um, I mean, in the same way that a television in a bar is is um, you know a quick way to ruin a conversation, right? It's it, it's it's magnetic. <laughs> so um, it's um, yeah. I, but I think that the that the uh, that that uh, that my relationship to boys is very much like that. That I, that I feel um, sort of simultaneously um, um, close to him in some way, but I also feel I still feel quite ignorant about what actually happened, um, having not ever seen any of the things firsthand. So it. Um, and I think, again, I think that relationship ended up, um, you know, to him and to, to, to other artists and other forms of art, became, you know, became some kind of a blue, blueprint for the way um, I started thinking about my own work. Just showing a few more examples of the um, work that follows a similar equation of a video monitor showing a performance previously done with with sculpture. This was your first show at, um, at Barbara Gladstone's or Stuart Reagan's, I'm not sure which mm -hmm. installation. This is, these are video stills from Auto Shaft, which was the piece you showed at Documenta in 92, and this is an installation where you see the, the video monitor with the sculpture. Um, and here it's really interesting because the, the setting itself became also so much a part of the, um, the narrative, and I know we've spoken before about how you use places, um, geographies, locations as, as characters in your narratives. So it's folding in another element to, um, you know, the sculpture and, and the action. Mm -hmm. Is that something you were very conscious of then? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I follow you. These are the parking garage, which you, mm -hmm. you know, filmed the work in. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I thought you were just the same one. <laughs> Jumped ahead. Um, the you, the the parking garage was the site in in the film, and then also mm -hmm. where you showed the work. Mm -hmm. I mean, it since now has another. It belongs to the Tate, so it never will have that concordance mm -hmm. um, as it did then. But yeah, yeah. This was a. a uh, this piece changed certain things for me. I think it. Um, I mean, to describe the piece would probably be helpful. That that it it. There were two rooms that were shaped like that previous slide, um, and uh, those were in the bottom of a, a parking garage. And um, in each of those rooms, there were um, objects and, and videos. The videos described this uh, story that took place within those rooms, within the whole parking garage, and within the different uh, elevator shafts and the different museums at Documenta. So it, um, I think it was the first time that I was able to project a story out over a, um, a larger, um, um, a space that was sort of larger than the, than, than the sculpture could literally inhabit. And, um, uh, and it, um, and I think it was around the time that, that Auto Shaft was made that I started making drawings for the cremaster cycle, about about choosing these um, these locations across the map um, that had some kind of autobiographical uh, 
relevance, um, or in certain cases, um, you know, geological re relevance uh, or mythological relevance that could be um, could be visualized as one thing, um, and eventually, um, um, you know, eventually, yeah, one form. Um, but Otto Schaft, in a, in a, in a much more uh, provisional, slightly clunky way, was, uh, was trying to do that by inhabiting these different spaces in Castle. Which you captured. There were three channels to the video, yeah? So yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's this, of course, which is the performance that was done in the Guggenheim as part of Cremaster III as the, as the, sort of the insert, in a sense, the, the part called the order, um, which exists almost only cinematically, but still has that relationship between the performance and then the, the video of it existing as sculpture, which is the jumbotron piece hanging in the middle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then you had mentioned narrative sculpture. Um, and in a way, boys kind of giving license to that. And I thought back to you know this this work was done in the um, you know late '60s, early '70s, when I think in Europe, um, in the United States, you had you know post minimalism, conceptual art, and very few examples of people really you know telling stories, let alone using ancient myth or religious symbology or and such. And here you have pieces like like this and. It was really interesting in terms of the trajectory of your work that we're talking about, that when you um, moved the footage or the video from the installation itself into the theater, projected it as film, that your sculptures became increasingly narrow, they became the bearer of the content of the story. Um, it was no longer a kind of um, triangulated relationship, or if it was, it was much larger. You, know, you had the theater and the gallery. Mm -hmm. versus everything happening in the gallery. Mm -hmm. And um, was that a very conscious decision, or is that something that? Um... Uh, well, eventually it was. But I think uh, it didn't start out that way at all. It started out, um, it started out, um, I mean, it was visualized much more as an earthwork in the, the beginning. Cycle. The cremaster cycle. The cremaster cycle. This is your question, isn't it? Um, it's about the evolution of um, narrative sculpture really becoming, like I have, it, I have on the screen now, the view of you from Cremaster 4 uh -huh. um, and the tunnel and then how, you know, the cars and the tunnel were then represented in a sculptural form. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Where I guess you can also talk about the Cremaster cycle itself as, as a large narrative. Form. Yeah, I guess what I was about to say is that the relationship between um, the cinema and the the, uh, the exhibition space was um, was not something that I, I didn't start out the did, I didn't start out thinking these were films and would be shown in cinemas. I was about to say, mm. um, but there was always, of course, the intention of telling five stories on on video that would um, uh, that would have some sort of playback mechanism. I just didn't know what it was when I started it and. Um, and it was harder for me to uh, to separate the different elements, uh, you know, not and not think about it in, in terms of one whole um, form, which um, which I was thinking about in terms of, of the, the tradition of the earthworks, um, you know, and, and of, of taking that notion of the earthwork and 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 superimposing a narrative onto it. So in that sense, uh, yes, the intention was, was there from the start to create a narrative sculpture in general. Right. Um, and I think, um, and in that way, certainly all of the, the, uh, the form that would come out of that larger form would be narrative. And um, um, yeah. Well, here's some specific examples, I guess, um, from Cremaster 4 mm. into the major sculptural object mm. that 
and then the Chrysler Imperial, which is the piece the Guggenheim owns and has been in the, you've seen it already in the installation shots in Berlin. Which, and these are stills from um, Cremaster Three. I mean, if you wanted to say anything about um, mm -hmm. the sort of movement from the film into the, sure. the sculptures, because I think I mean we could pick one, maybe yeah. it might take too we long. Have <laughs> We have Cremaster four. Why don't you go three, to five? five. Okay. okay. Here we go. Yeah. That's the um, the Queen of Chain in the in the uh, Cremaster five narrative, and um, she takes her name from the the Lancet Bridge, which um, you have a picture of, right? Yeah. And that uh, Lancet means chain. It's the first. Um, chain suspension bridge um, built over the Danube between Buda and Pest. And Cremaster um, uh, 5 started to, um, you know, wanted to make the final chapter of Cremaster of, of uh, speak to this notion of a separation anxiety, of, um, of um, you know, again, trying to describe this threshold between potential energy and um, and the release of, of energy or the spending of that potential energy. And, um, and so five was always visualized as a death of sorts um, and, um, uh, or a letting go. Um, and and this, uh, um, this notion of using the bridge as an or organizing principle um, um, and the character of the, the queen of chain who was loosely based on um, uh, Harry Houdini's mother um, uh, and the, this, uh, the other principal character who sort of has three forms. There's a, there's a, a diva, the magician, and the, the, the giant. And uh, the magician is, is a more literal um, depiction of, the, of Houdini. Um, and the magician goes, uh, steps up onto the edge of the bridge and um, prepares to jump. And the, the queen um, is um, sort of lamenting um, this suicide she thinks she's witnessing. And, um, um, and, um, and so at the end of the film, you see uh, Houdini jump off the bridge, and um, and you see two. Uh, you see what starts. Um, you see the queen collapse, um, and um, metaphorically, she's taking her own life to try to join the the magician in this um, in his um, in his death. Um, a droplet of, of uh, fluid leaves the mouth of the queen and uh, divides and drops into uh, two pools that are in a space beneath her throne. And this is the space of uh, the Gellert bath. Do you have an image of that? No, no, I just have the sculpture. No, no, sorry. You do, no, no. yeah. So there's the Gellert bath. Um, that, that was one of the other primary sites of the of, of Cremaster Five, and it was, um, I was interested in that saddle between these two pools, um, another way of, of expressing this, rela this, this split between two, um, between two forms, um, also a way of, of, um, sort of vis visualizing the, the, the perineum of, of the Queen of Chain, and, um, and what would be the impression of her onto her throne. So. Um, the, the this space of these two baths is a projection um, from her uh, impression onto the onto the throne. So um, when she collapses and this um, this fluid discharges from her mouth, it, it divides and falls into the two pools beneath her. So um, when this story was crystallized into a sculpture. Um, it was a, it was a, an expression of the 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 the, uh, the two um, droplets that leave the queen um, the queen's mouth, and I think when I made that piece, I was thinking that there were um, that those two <clears throat> those two droplets were, and one was an expression of uh, 
of, of death, of what she, what she perceived to be the death of the magician. And the other one was um, the possibility that, um, um, that the piece could cycle back to, to Cree Master One and the cycle could, could start again. And um, in the same way that, uh, that, that all of these um, performances of Houdini's were sort of rehearsals for death, but they weren't, um, um, they weren't about um, taking his life. They were about trying to, uh, to see what it looks like on the other side of, of death, I think. And um, so it's, um, in a certain way, it's a, uh, the, the Lancet piece is a, this is an expression of a misunderstanding between um, those, those two characters, those two aspects of this, this same form. Um, so it ends, I think that the, the, the cycle ends in conflict that way, but it, but it, it proposes a couple of, um, of options. You know, one is for the form to die and express itself um, as a form, a crystallized form, and the other is for it to cycle back and start again in the, uh, the, the state of initiation. When there, your show was up at the Guggenheim, people often asked, um, people who hadn't seen the films yet, who were just experiencing the sculpture on the ramps, um, how, you know, whether they could really understand or fully um, experience the sculptures without seeing the films, or whether the sculptures could exist without the films. Um, and I always answered that that really was a kind of moot question because they, the sculptures and the films both existed and one could experience them in whatever order um, they were able to. And it wasn't about a hierarchy of forms, but it is, is it something that you ever think about in terms of um, the legibility of, of um, how people can experience the sculptures, because that narrative you just explained is you know, very rich and complex, and, and you can get some of it from the film, and of course, some of it from reading about the films. Um, or I guess my question to you is, how do you feel about people approaching the sculptures as just really formal also? Is that something that um, appeals to you, or you? Um, I, well, I think that uh, <clears throat> I, mean, I think that there are a number of ways. There are a number of ways in, and I think that, um, um, and I'm interested in all of them. I'm, I, I'm, I've shown them in a num number of different situations where um, where the film is um, is shown in proximity to the, the object, or where the film isn't shown at all, um, or where the film is on its own without any of the objects. And I think that they're, you know, those are very different experiences, obviously, but um, um, I guess I feel like um, these things are all out in the world, and they're, they all exist as, they still exist as one thing. And, um, um, I mean, I say this um, in terms of my own relationship to looking at art, you know, made by other people. I, I, I f I'm very willing to follow a trail of crumbs that an artist leaves behind, and and travel around and see the different pieces that comprise a group. Um, and um, and so I I think that. Um, that this work is made with with the um, assumption that that somebody's going to have the willingness to do that mm -hmm. and um, and to make those connections eventually and I think it goes actually beyond the the uh, the films and the objects and the uh, uh, the photography and the drawing that there's um, you know there are books that are right. that have um, made which uh, you know, which I really do consider to be part of this mm -hmm. form. Um, and the soundtracks. Right. Which, uh, you know, I can't claim I've made, but... Uh, but they're part. But they are part of it, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
And this was another example of sculpture and narrative, but maybe we should, unless there's something more you wanted to say about. These are um, examples from the most recent film drawing, Restraint 9. And the other relationship to boys that I was hoping to discuss is the kind of inherent theatricality in his work that he was adopted um, a number of persona, persona, you know, shaman and teacher and politician and activist, and it was really inseparable from his art and um, inseparable from his life. Whereas for you, your work is incredibly theatrical as well, and the perform performative aspect informs probably all you do, but, um, and you assume roles, but the roles end when the work is over, in a sense. I mean, it's not. Um, and we were talking a little bit about, with boys, the idea of projection outward, and that his, um, his mission was really messianic. It was out to change the world in a very utopian, modernist, way, and your work is more about a kind of interiority, mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, that's really a fundamental difference, even though there's a kind of sameness there, mm -hmm. um, in terms of the performative, and these are just some examples of not only you assuming roles, but also appropriating theatrical genres um, that you kind of use at will, depending on the story at hand. But I'm, I'm just curious in terms of what, you know, where you think you are in the work. Um, and that's sort of a hard question, but. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the thing you said about interiority is, um, would be, uh, I mean, the way that I would start to define it really, and that I think that, um, that I think that there's a, an attempt to, um, to create an internal landscape that um, you know that uses biological structure um, to give it to to establish it to establish an interior uh, a st structure that's inside me, um, and then I think that there's an attempt to um, to very quickly abstract that into something that's dysfunctional um, or something that's uh, that's trying to um, you know, dissolve its functionality, and um, and I think that it has to do with trying to um, you know create a multiplicity out of um, you know f you know from that starting point within the body, um, you know, to make uh, these characters potential um, uh, or to make them visible, um, and. Um, Yeah, and I think as far as I can say that I understand boys, I think that that I would say that 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 uh, I mean his project has is, is, is sort of the opposite in that way. It is very much about um, um, you know projecting a um, an individual in, 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 a, in an outward way and uh, um, very unified um, persona. Uh, yeah, a unified persona, um, but to um, um, you know certainly to diversify, but um, but I think um, I think if I'm forced to identify what what it is I think I'm doing, yeah, I think that it's much more about trying to um, um, to move. Uh, you know, to, to in a certain way turn myself inside out, or turn uh, to go inside and try to dissolve, um, to dissolve myself into a place where, um, um, yeah, where where things can become multiple. That's a very risky, brave um, aspiration, I think. You know, when it's so much today is about the sort of the ego of the artist and the um, the, the signature look and the you know the identifiable theme 
um, and to choose something that's polymorphous and, and you know, potentially um, limitless in a way is, is, I think, really a quite remarkable risk. Um, it's almost eight, so I just wanted to, so many images. <laughs> It's frozen. No, okay. Just jump ahead for a moment to maybe end on this, and then I'll leave you with um, questions from the audience. Um, this work, which you mentioned, the Lama um, which was the pageant staged during um, Carnival in Bahia in a collaboration with Arta Lindsay, in which it was a, a big parade truck, um, in which you've made a film out of it that involved. Um, all kinds of mythological narratives, which maybe we might go into. But um, in terms of our discussion with boys, what was really interesting to see is this was post cremasters that it was a moving outward into a very social environment. It involved the participation of almost a thousand people, dancing, um, musicians. It, um, it had a more kind of public-oriented message, and then it dealt with uh, the ecology of the area. And um, you know, one of the characters is Julia Butterfly Hill, who's an eco-activist. Um, so it seemed like a shift in a way, although it still had many of the, the um, themes that had been in all of the other work. But this really felt different. Um, and I don't know if that is a, a direction that you're interested in exploring or, or could just say something more about that. Because at least in the project we just did, it felt like a place where boys you know, political activities and activist activities and your um, kind of maybe burgeoning consciousness of, of, of moving the work further out into the world um, met. Yeah, I mean, I, I, as I was saying before, I think it was a, it was a way of uh, uh, cleaning my palate after the cremaster cycle. I think I was um, really craving to put myself in a situation where I really couldn't um, control uh, the environment the way that you can in, uh, on a stage, a uh, film stage, um, and, um, you know, or through the process of editing. And, uh, and so, um, you know, I was invited by somebody, by, by Arta Lindsay, to come to, uh, to Carnival and visit. And, uh, and the following year, we, went, uh, we decided to make a, a float. And, um, and it was done with a couple of months of preparation. It was, um, it was a very different project for me. Um, but it did lead to, uh, I think, working in a real condition like that um, and trying to tell, um, you know, I would say a similar kind of story that I had been telling with, with Cremaster, but in a completely different context. Um, it, it, it started to, uh, I mean, it created the, the, the foundation for what was, uh, what Drawing the Straight Nine became, um, to go to Japan and to, uh, to uh, make a piece on this uh, whaling ship um, together with the crew of that whaling ship, uh, using them as the cast. Um, you know, working within their um, their working schedule, working our filming filming schedule around their uh, working schedule. Um, so it um, you know what what happened in Brazil was quite chaotic and completely out of control. Where um, whereas in, in in Japan, I think the better the more successful aspects of the project in in, in Brazil were. Um, you know, we're used as uh, you know organizing principles for for drawing a straight nine. I'm really sorry, but I'm sure you have many questions, so I won't monopolize. Anymore. <laughs>
Right. Uh huh. There's um. Should I get this right? There are um. In um, kimono dress, the the uh, the innermost um, layer is, is called harajuban. It's um. It's like the underwear layer of a of a kimono, and um, and I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to represent all of the layers of the kimono um, using um, uh, land mammal, um, uh, different um, aspects of land mammal, and um, to to uh, to set up the situation in the tea ceremony where the the two characters could start to uh, transform in, into um, into sea mammals and. Um, so that skin, um, um, to be quite honest with you, is not a land mammal, <laughs> but um, but rather it's an ostrich. It's an ostrich skin, but it's not tanned. It's um, which is why it's still quite um, pliable like that. Um, whereas all the other layers were were done with uh, elk hide and uh, horse hide and. Uh, uh, in her case, coyote and uh, fox and uh, yeah, a number of different furs that way. Can you say the last part of that again? Yeah, the uh, I think that ha that happens often. I think things that that are edited out of the the piece that I'm working on find their way into the next project often um, in some way. Um, although that said, I think a lot of this stuff is um, it's indigenous, right? It's um, you know, like in the case of Drawing Restraint 9, a lot of that um, material came from that place. And um, it would be hard to, to bring that material to another narrative, I would say. Um, but, and the first part of your question was, what, 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 why am I attracted to it? Uh huh. Um, why am I attracted to it? I mean, I think that it's. Um, yeah, I think it, I think it makes me comfortable. I think that I'm. Um, you know, I work with a team of people, and I think that I've more or less done that right from the start. And I, I have a feeling it's because I grew up playing football that I'm really used to working with a team of people and being a part of a team. And I think um, 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 so a plan is drawn and everybody understands what the plan is and we execute the plan. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I enjoy following the rules. It's, um, yeah, it's... Um, it doesn't really feel so much like a decision as much as it is a, um, uh, something that I'm very comfortable with. I'm just really curious why you uh, frame your drawings mm -hmm. the way you do and the material itself sort of overwhelms the drawing and it makes it, like it sound like the drawings are a very, very important part. Mm -hmm. so, can you talk about that in the medium? So mm -hmm. Yeah, they um, well compared to some of the the drawings that Nancy showed tonight, um, the frames um, let's say the frames that were made between uh, let's see, ninety nineteen eighty nine and ninety three often had. Um, a much more elaborate design to them. They were um, 
they often had, um, they were made from prosthetic plastic and they had a, a speculums that would be um, appearing to pull the, the frame open to reveal the interiority of the, the drawing. And I think, I think I'd always considered the, the drawings to be the most internal place in the work that way. And so the frames function as orifices somehow that, that would be opening up to reveal that interior place. And so um, I think as the, 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 the frames did become more simple over time, but they never stopped having that kind of materiality of, uh, of a kind of prosthetic, um, you know, a, a, a plastic that belongs to that family of plastics that the body can accept, that those, those plastics can live within the body. They can, they can be applied to the body to build the body outward, the, the, the prosthetic family. And... Um, um, yeah, the, 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 that's how the drawings function for me. Yeah. I had a question about uh, the pacing of the work. Both the films and the sculpture pieces, they tend to be created with the intention of taking up a very long amount of time. One of the things about the films is that they have very vivid memories of most of the scenes in all the films, um, and partly with the fact that they are so long, and most modern films are kind of constant. So I was wondering if you were talking to me about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think that the, we touched a little bit on this, that, that I didn't, um, I mean, it, it, it's, uh, it's taken a long time for me to, uh, even with the Cree masterpieces, to, to identify them as films, in, in the sense that they really grew out of... Um, um, the use of video as a way of documenting real-time performance, um, you know, where the video was simply used to um, yeah, document something that was happening over a, a good amount of time, and, um, and so that I think as you know, even as these pieces became more filmic or more cinematic, I was still designing scenes where. Uh, um, um, where a material would be manipulated or um, a form would be generated or even a relationship between characters would take place which, um, which were performed in real time and we would shoot them in real time. And, um, and they, um, it would be very rare for something to be shot in the way, you know, with the economy that films are usually shot. Um, and I think, um, I mean, I don't think I would actually be capable of doing it any other way. I think it's, it's, my, it's, it's my nature. I think, um, um, you know, I'm interested in, in having that experience of, um, um, of performing things that way. So I think that, uh, and although the, that footage is edited down, it's still... Um, you know, I think it's still answering to the, the, the energy it had as a real-time um, activity or, or action. So are you saying that you didn't do many takes? Or? Um, well, it depends on the, the, the scene. I mean, I guess I'm talking more about major scenes. Of course, there are insert shots and transitional moments where, um, where things are done in a much more uh, traditional way in terms of filmmaking. Um, you know, close-ups and uh, uh, um, yeah, what I would say are more transitional uh, images or scenes. But, the, um, but if, if you try to think about each of those stories uh, having these sort of major blocks within them, those blocks tend to be um, um, quite durational. But um, I guess the answer is, yeah, wherever possible, I would do multiple takes. But a lot of those things you can't do that with. You have to, um, to let the thing take place and, and, um, and keep the camera rolling. Mm. And also, if, if now that you've developed such a rich 
visual vocabulary of their own. I think if that's changed over time, if now it's taken on such a life of its own that you're not as influenced by other people's work. Mm -hmm. In general, how you see people like Boyce or any other artists, mm -hmm. how it gets into you, how, how it gets into your work. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> how does how do the influence, how do the artists that do influence him, um, how does he take them into his work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, I think with the case of Boyce, that, that um, I don't think I have had thought so much about him um, since I was a student. I think I thought a lot about him as a student. Um, so, so working on this project with Nancy was interesting. It was sort of um, an opportunity to, uh, yeah, to uh, be a student again in, so, in some way, and, um, and and realize for sure that there was a lot of misunderstanding as much as there was an understanding. Um, just in an answer to your question, um, I mean, I, th I would say that in the during the years that the, the Cree Master Cycle was made, that um, you know that filmmakers were probably more um, in that were, were, were playing that role for me. Um, in that each of those chapters was wanting to uh, inhabit a genre, and um, and so with each chapter as as it was being made, I would go into that genre and try to find um, you know, aspects of that genre that the Pre-master cycle could attach itself to, and um, um, <clears throat> but I would say that that isn't, uh, you know. I think when you're thinking about something as a vessel that way, um, it isn't uh, going particularly deep in, inside you, is it? It's um, um, and in the same way that the, the myth of Marcius and Apollo, I think, is it's just sort of a vessel. It's a it's a container for um, for my narrative. And um, and I think that the the films that I had been looking at during that time were were approached in the same way. They were um, um, yeah, they're vessels. Um, Yeah, um, I, st I still feel like I still have an answer to your question. Really. I mean, I think when I, s I, I see something that I like, I mean, I think it tends to, to go in, you know, in, in to me in a very visceral way, in a very, um, 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 and, and, and I think once that happens, I'm, 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 I'm willing to be more um, cerebral about it. But until that happens, I'm not willing to do that. I'm not willing to go to the desk at the gallery and read about it. You know, it would have to be, um, it would have to affect me um, viscerally before I'm willing to take that ride. And once I am, I'm, I'm very, very willing to. So Matthew, if I could ask, how did the conversation with Matthew actually evolve into an actual exhibition where you did install your works directly in conversation with Boyce? With Just out of a series of conversations with her or yeah. something you wanted to do? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's important to say that um, um, that that it was essentially a collection show, right? It was taking work from the Guggenheim collection of Boyce and mine and putting them into a conversation. So, um, so it had a quite finite range of possibilities. Um, so, um, I mean, I think so. That was a pretty easy question to ask. Um, in the sense that it could have been done with me or without me, but I think that that because of my relationship with Nancy, it was um, it was quite interesting to work together again and to um, to um, yeah and to uh, and to learn something. We didn't talk much about the um, the film program. It was one of the more interesting things for me that uh, that happened in Berlin. Um, we collaborated with a, an art house cinema that was um, um, nearby and took um, some of the old documentation from boys' performances that weren't really complete. You know, they were 
news clippings, some of their news newsreel footage that was, um, you know, that had uh, kind of broken commentary over the top of it. Um, some of the documents were more complete, um, and we we showed um, um, video works of mine um, and pieces like these of his, um, and it ended up. Being, I think, quite interesting in, in, in the way that um, Nancy had talked about there being a kind of, uh, let's say, a lack of, of, of uh, presence that, that Boyce has for, for a younger generation in Germany right now. And it, that was surprising to me in the first place. But, um, but to see some of this, this footage on film um, made me believe that... that, um, that that because you don't see that material very often, that could be the, the problem. That, that, that without him, um, the sculpture, um, you know, as, asks you to, um, uh, to to know the narrative and to understand the narrative. And without the without that footage, you you, you, you might not, unless you're a scholar of, of boys, or whether you lived or if you lived in that um, in that period. So um, it felt like a, a, a key to me somehow that that I feel like that material needs to be seen more. I wondered, though, if, if boys, I mean, I remember seeing Drawing Restraint 9 and wondered if boys had bubbled up to the surface more for you in terms of its connection and relevance to you in that, because there's this amazing scene in Drawing Restraint 9 on the whaling ship where you're making that large sculpture mm. out of Vaseline, mm. which references, or in my, I immediately thought of boys and the, the piece, in fact, the Hirschhorn piece that we have here uh, just outside in the lower level galleries is a fragment of a large cast that that Boyce did for Munster Project in 1977. Mm. That was also a large cast of space. Mm. And I didn't, I mean, I thought it was fascinating to hear that you were doing this project with Nancy because it just seemed that Boyce was sort of bubbling up. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know if that was just a concurrence or mm. it just seemed like a natural extension of exploring it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Hmm. I mean, I would say that it wasn't the... Um, that that tallow piece wasn't the, at all the starting point of the that notion in, in drawing restraint nine, but it um, you know certainly something that I thought about. I had made um, a piece uh, in London in um, around the time that the cycle show was in Paris, and um, I was invited by uh, Art Angel in, in London to to make a project there. So we took the five Pre-master films and put them in a cinema in Brixton, and in the in the lobby, we cast uh, about ten tons of petroleum jelly into um, into the shape of the plum level, which is one of the dominant forms in uh, Cremaster Three, and um, and I was really eager at that point, you know, after seeing the Cremaster Cycle exhibition finished and seeing it installed in uh, in Cologne. To, to make one more sculpture, um, and one that would, would have a much more entropic um, nature, um, and that I always had identified and felt that the, that, that the Cremaster project in general was, was like that, um, and that, that somehow none of the sculptures that were made um, really expressed it in the way that I felt it needed to be expressed. So, this piece in Brixton had um, that kind of intention, um, just knowing that, that pouring that much petroleum jelly would fail as a casting. It would collapse. Um, and it collapsed in a much more aggressive way than I expected, but it, um, <laughs> it, um, you know, wanted, I, I wanted it to be um, an expression of fa failure that way. And, um, and, um, so that was sort of the beginning of, uh, of, um, of the Drawing Restraint 9 idea. And, um, you know, we, we remade made that piece a couple of times, and, and the, um, the environment of dealing with that much petroleum jelly ended up, um, you know, leading to this notion of working on a, on a whaling ship. The idea that, that uh, being around that much fat, um, whale fat, must feel something like this. Um, dealing with that much petroleum jelly. So um, there was this proposal at that point to, um, to make one of these large cast pieces on a boat, you know, on, on an unstable surface. 
and, um, and to allow for the condition of the ocean to affect the form, the way that the, the form would behave. And, uh, um, but I certainly never stopped thinking about the tallow piece during, the, um, during that production. Do you want to take one more question? Oh my gosh, many questions. <laughs> yes. uh, three artists that haven't been mentioned that I want, want to hear your take on uh -huh. are Duchamp, uh -huh. um, Eve Klein, mm -hmm. and Robert Wilson. Mm -hmm. Do you have any interest in those artists? Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Um, yeah, Eve Klein, hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that there's a, uh, the documentation of, of, of Eve Klein's actions are a little more um, complete, I think, than some of the other artists that I was more focused on. Um, but, um, Yeah, but I would say in the same way that there's a, uh, you know, there's a way that this stuff is represented in, in catalogs. The things, the kinds of things that you have access to as a student, um, you know, things are reduced to a couple of stills. And um, um, uh, in the case of Eve Klein, even the, um, you know, the image of him jumping is, um, is reproduced more than anything else, isn't it? Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, Robert Wilson. I was, you know, I'm, I'm, after after making this piece in uh, in Brazil, this float in, in this uh, carnival. Um, I'm. Um, it's something that I'm thinking more and more about now of uh, developing a piece for, for stage. And so, um, you know, some of these guys who have made. Um, um, Made uh, theater work that way that that, that still um, exists within the um, the sensibility of, of uh, you know, the plastic arts um, are, are becoming more visible to me. Which I have to I have to confess that as a you know coming out of school at the end of the 80s, um, Wilson and uh, um, some of the other people from that generation were um, were not of interest to me at all. I think. Um, and that I think I was, you know, much more um, interested in um, in object-based performance and um, and something that I could clearly identify as sculpture. Um, and um, and in fact, theater seemed to be the the enemy of that in a certain way because uh, because object-based performance had been overtaken, at least in America, had been overtaken by by theater of that nature. Um, and um, but that said, I am much more interested in, in um, considering it now. Yeah, you know, in a funny way, I would say dance is probably more has always been more interesting to me than than some of that work. Um, you know, because it has a very clear relationship to gravity and um, 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 you know, to physical conflict and to, to yeah, exactly. It's something that I feel like I can relate to. Um, very easily. One more question. You, you were. Thank you. Um, you mentioned about football. Yeah. Many years ago, has an influence on your work today. Mm -hmm. What other aspects of your life in the past? How does it affect your work? And how is it displayed? Um. <clears throat> Well, I think that um, um, having grown up in Idaho, I think my relationship to that landscape um, was um, was important to several pieces that I made. Um, I mean, it, it um, you know, growing up in southern Idaho made uh, um, the Executioner song. Norman Mailer's book interesting to me as a as a text that I could work from, which Cremaster Two is is based on the Executioner's song. Um, um, 
I would say both in terms of its depiction of the, the character of Gary Gilmore, but also in the way that the book describes the Mormon Basin, the, that space between the Wasatch Front and the, the, uh, the Bonneville Salt Flats, the, um, you know, the way that, that, uh, that, that uh, a kind of psychological pressure is described in a, in a place where there's a great deal of space. Um, very true of, of southern Idaho as well. It's a kind of, um, you know, there are these valleys that are quite open. Um, and in spite of that fact, there's no space at all. You know, it's, um, it's very confining. So I think, um, yeah, I think that my relationship to, to space and to landscape and, and even to the urban condition I live in now has very much to do with where I grew up. Matthew, maybe you could just we could close with you talking a little bit about what you're doing in Manchester and your return to live performance and thinking about that and its relationship to dance. Do you want to? Yeah, I, I can't say much about it, but I can um, I, mean, I can say that I'm I am developing a piece for for stage and um, I'm doing a a very small section of it in Manchester in in July, um, which will probably be no more than ten minutes long, and that's part of a a project of uh, 10 to 12 artists have all been asked to do, um, these are all visual artists, none of them are um, come from a theater background, um, to do 10 minute long performances one after another in a way that um, someone is imagining would come together as an opera or would have some kind of an operatic arc to, to it as an evening. Um, but it comes at a good time for me because I am also developing a longer um, evening-length piece for stage, right? Now. Great. Well, everyone, please join me in giving a big round of applause to Matthew Barney. Thank you for coming. Good night. <laughs>